Well, first of all, I want to apologize for my backdrop here. Uh, I don't have a whole bunch of books there, and the reason for that is that I use a Kindle. And I have a hundred books in my Kindle, so I can assure you that I'm a learned person. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about sex and gender. We're hearing an awful lot about these things lately, and I would just like to make some comments about that. And um, my uh, philosophical background is Thomism, and one of the principles of Thomism is that you should always start a discussion by defining your terms. So I want to do that. You know, what is gender? What is sex? And um, first of all, when in this discussion of changing your sex or changing your gender, um, when we talk about sex, we're talking about your biological sex. Uh, and uh, that is determined at the moment of your conception. Um, the female uh, pro produces an ovum, and that always has an X. In other words, it's always potentially female. The male has two kinds of sperm. There's androsperm and gymnosperm. Now, if an androsperm combines with the ovum, you're going to have a male then and there. If a gymnosperm uh, reunites with the ovum, you're going to have a female. So your biological sex, whether you are male or female, is determined the moment you come in, into existence as a, a conceptus in your mother's womb. It isn't something the doctor assigns you uh, nine months later when you're born. It's already determined at the moment of conception. Gender. Up until recently, that was a word that uh, pertained to language. Uh, in the Romance languages, uh, nouns and adjectives are either male, neuter, or female. Uh, for example, agricola in Latin uh, means farmer, but it is feminine. So the word ends in a, uh, that's why it's feminine, and then any adjective modifying it would have to be also have the feminine form to it. Now we've taken the word gender, which was originally a, a linguistic term, and we're applying it in some way to a person's sexual identity. And how exactly are we doing that? What exactly does that mean? Uh, it's not very clear. One of the things that has inspired me in my work a lot has been the serenity prayer, which uh, is very uh, popular in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it talks about knowing the difference between the things I can change and the things I cannot change. Uh, and having the, um, the wisdom to accept the things that I cannot change, or having the patience, I think the prayer says, to have the things that I cannot change. Now, that has consequences for this idea of changing one's sex. Because changing one's sex is one of those things that you cannot change. It was determined once and for all at the moment of conception. And there isn't a thing you can do about it to change that. So that's one of the things that has to be accepted. In the psychology field, we base a lot of what we do on the field of medicine, and medicine is based largely on the field of biology. Uh, so what is important for a psychologist, up until recently at least, has been, and to my way of thinking should be, the biological dimension. In other words, the first question we ask is, what is the case? And only after that do we ask the question, how do I feel? And what is the case, that's what has to be accepted. You can't change that. An, an example of this is if you have someone who was shot, and he's on a gurney, and he's being wheeled into the emergency room, and an orderly is by his side, and the orderly is shouting uh, questions to find out what this person's mental status is. Is he in touch with reality? And the first question they ask that man is, What is your name, sir? And if I was the one on that gurney, and I said, Marsha, I would be in big trouble because they would realize this guy doesn't know who he is. 
Um, the right answer, of course, is Marshall with, a, with two L's, and that would indicate to them that I know who I am, that I am oriented, in other words, facing reality, uh, and that I'm in touch with reality, and that things aren't that bad. Now, basic principle of mental health, something that we took for granted all the way through graduate school, <clears throat> excuse me, was that it is mentally healthy to live in reality, to live in and acknowledge and interact with what is, in fact, the case. So that means that your intellect with its five senses is primary. Your five senses tell you what is the case. It tells you, it tells me, for example, I'm male. It tells me that um, I was, my mother was Molly Feitlin. My father was Jimmy Feitlin. I was born on the third floor of New Britain General Hospital. There's nothing I can do to change those facts. All those facts are things that have to be accepted. And I have to live my life facing those facts and dealing with those facts and not thinking those are things that I can change and trying to change them. If there is some kind of disproportion between reality and how I feel about reality, the mental health profession is supposed to help the feeling component get in touch with the reality component. It isn't supposed to hand the person over to a doctor to make them a male look like a female because I feel like a female. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves that from a mental health perspective is what am I, not what do I want? Now, the people who are drumming the drumbeat for sex change, they remind me of people who run a cult. In a cult, you are told by the leader, pay no attention to your five senses. Don't listen to what your senses are telling you about reality. Just listen to me. And so what the person is expected to do in a cult then is to deny the evidence of the senses and just listen to the leader tell you what you're supposed to believe about what you are seeing. So there's something very, to my mind, unhealthy about that whole notion. Now, the mental health profession, as far as I can see, has caved in completely on this. They aren't confronting the patient with reality. Instead, they are just getting on board with what the patient feels or what the patient wants. Uh, if they did insist on reality, they would be told that they are haters, that they hate the patient. Uh, the reality is that if you have a patient who is biologically, from the moment of his conception, male, and thinks he's female, you have a person who's given up on himself. And the mental health professional should be a person who doesn't give up on that person, who keeps insisting you can face reality. You don't have to retreat into this fantasy world. So, what I'm saying is that uh, mental health professionals and medical professionals, in, to my mind, should insist on reality. They should uh, not go along with the wishes or the feelings of the person and consider them normative. Uh, and again, the reason for that, they should do that for their own mental health. If I look at someone who's obviously a male and keep acting as though I think that person is female, that is deadly for my own mental health. So in the interest of the mental health of the professional doctor or psychologist, we shouldn't simply go along with the wishes and the feelings of the client. Um, we also shouldn't go along with them for the client's sake. Because as I say, what we've got there is the client has given up on himself. And it's our duty as professionals to make sure that we don't. <laughs>